Today, a conversation with Pat Hodgins from Kangaroo Island. Pat is a threatened species ecologist who works on various projects throughout Australia with a focus on South Australia and Northern Territory conservation projects. He has lived and worked on Kangaroo Island since 2015 and has been researching the Kangaroo Island Dunart since 2017. Pat is also involved in really interesting conservation projects in the Tiwi Islands and other islands in the top end. I don't think we'll have time to talk about all of your cool work today, Pat, but we might have to get you back to share a bit about those. He was also part of the AWC team working on the translocation of golden bandicoots last year from the Kimberley to New Haven. And Pat has been integral in the construction and ongoing work at AWC's Western River Refuge, which is the only cat-free area on Kangaroo Island. Pat, it's really great to speak to you from Kangaroo Island. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Jay. Good to um, be part of it. Now, for those of us who haven't been to Kangaroo Island, can you paint a picture of us for, for what the island's like? How do you get there, for one? And then what does it look like when you're on the ground? Yeah, no worries. Well, I think it's one of the best places uh, on Earth, but I am a little bit biased, I guess. But um, yeah, so Kangaroo Island is Australia's third largest island. So it's a lot bigger than most people realise. It's it's about 140 kilometres um, east to west and about 50 kilometres north, north to south. Um, so it is a, a large island. Uh, it's about 20 k's off the South Australian coast, about 100, 100 k's south of Adelaide. Um, so to get here, uh, the main way people get over is, is by a ferry, about a 45 minute ferry or a, a, a very short flight from Adelaide. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a pretty amazing place. Um, there's a, a few things that I think really set Kangaroo Island apart from um, other places in Southern Australia. I think number one is that we still have a lot of intact bushland. About 50% of Kangaroo Island is still native remnant bush with some very large um, tracts of connected bushland, especially out on the western end of the island, um, which is coincidentally where most of the, the fire impacts were. Um, the eastern end of the island is is probably a bit more clear, a bit more fragmented um, with, with farming land, but still has, you know, high quality um, vegetation linking up um, little patches out there. Um, yeah, it's, it's a, a pretty amazing place with, um, you know, really good, you know, amazing beaches and bays, um, really nice climate. Um, about 4,000 people spread out across the island, so it's not really dense kind of living. Um, lots of farmlands, uh, great community. And I think, you know, it's it's really important biologically um, because of that that intact bushland, but also a high amount of endemism. Um, one of Australia's biodiversity hotspots, Western Kangaroo Island. Um, and really importantly, I think one of the things that really sets it apart is that we don't have any rabbits or also any foxes on the island. So that makes it yeah incredibly important from an ecological perspective. Interesting. So, so no rabbits or foxes, and you mentioned a lot of endemic um, animals that are found only on KI. There's also been this really interesting history of introductions of Australian species from other places, which is sort of bizarre. Can you tell us a bit about some of the species that were brought to Kangaroo Island that don't really belong there? Yeah, no, there's there's quite a few. It was, it's quite an amazing history, actually, of species that were brought over, some of them with really good intentions because they were, um, you know, identified as becoming, you know, threatened or endangered on the mainland. So the, the most famous one is the koala. Um, so that was brought over from a, a very, the original founders were only four, four animals that were brought over to the island. They were then supplemented over the years. Um, so, yeah, the koala in particular has done really well over here and in, uh, it's probably not well known to a lot of people, but yeah, it, it does cause some fairly um, significant ecological impacts to riparian vegetation. So it's a really interesting wildlife management issue that we've got over here where koalas are, are very common and abundant and overabundant at times. Um, but yeah, obviously on the eastern coast of Australia, they're, you know, endangered and declining. So it's a, a, an interesting one. But yeah, a whole host of different species were brought over here. Um, things like uh, laughing kookaburras, um, yeah, platypus also doing quite well on the western end of the island. Um, but yeah, also things like like the brush turkey from eastern Australia. And even last night I was reading the uh, the wonga pigeon. Um, so even, yeah, and so a lot of these species didn't didn't take, um, probably because there just wasn't a lot of them or the, the habitat wasn't suitable. But yeah, certainly some have done done very well indeed. What an interesting mix of, you know, native species unique to the island, but also things from the mainland, which, you know, some 
some are doing really, really well. Um, today, I think we'll focus on the things that are unique to Kangaroo Island, or at least native to Kangaroo Island, because that's what our, our main concern is with conservation projects on the island. And I think, you know, most people sort of became conscious of the wildlife of Kangaroo Island around the time of the Black Summer bushfires about four years ago. And this was a, a massive event, you know, it was part of those huge megafires that swept across many parts of Eastern and, and Southern Australia and Western Australia as well. Um, can you take us back to that really dreadful summer uh, and talk about the impact that those fires had and how they burned? Yeah, well, it was it was pretty amazing um, to be here during that during that whole process. It was was pretty full on. I mean, it was predicted that that black summer um, that that summer was going to be a pretty high fire danger year. So I think it wasn't unexpected that there were going to be fires. I mean, Kangaroo Island is a very highly flammable place. Um, it's it's always had fires um, and you know regular bushfires um, pretty much you know most summers. So I think everyone was preparing that there was going to be a, you know pretty pretty hardcore fire season, but yeah, it's certainly that was an, an unprecedented event, um, Black Summer. So we had a series of fires that that, that started on the Western End through lightning strikes, um, and then they just built up gradually over time as the, as the fire intensity uh, and the, the catastrophic fire conditions worsened. And yeah, and we just basically saw, you know, just massive impacts of that fire on the Western End. It ended up burning, um, yeah, pretty much 50% almost 50% of the island and pretty much the entirety of the western end. So taking out huge tracts of bushland, leaving very little um, in its path, a few small unburnt patches, um, taking out, you know, massive amounts of, of people's homes and farms and livestock, um, sadly, tragically claimed two human lives. Um, but yeah, it just was relentless. Hey? Like it just, it just continued. Um, huge amount of effort from people putting in, um, you know, firefighting efforts um, through you know, state government agencies, CFS, local landholders, farm fire units. It was, yeah, it was a really, really intense time. Um, and yeah, at one point, um, there was actually the whole island was on fire alert. So it was, was looking like the whole, there was only really two safe places for people to go on the island, Kingsgate and Penishaw. And then, yeah, one night at, yeah, kind of 2 a.m., it was even looking like Kingscote potentially wasn't going to be safe. So it was, yeah, a really, a really full-on experience. Um, and yeah, and I think, you know, still now, like four years on, the impacts are still huge. Um, there's still, you know, the impacts to, to people. Um, there's still people that, you know, are rebuilding houses and, you know, rebuilding farms and businesses. Um, and yeah, and pretty much wherever you go in the western end of the island, you can still obviously see the impacts that that fire has had from an ecological, an ecological perspective. Um, really large, you know, old, you know, 100 old year old stringy barks that still, you know, that have actually been actually killed. Wow. Um, by that fire um, but yeah but conversely also we're seeing a real you know um, good recovery in areas um, most of the areas we're seeing a pretty pretty good recovery of species um, but I think you know from there you go so what has that looked like you know I, I know that a lot of Australian vegetation is resilient to fire so it can either you know resist being killed by the flames or they've got strategies to re-sprout quickly and take advantage of the the nutrients that are available after the fire, after a really big hot fire like this, what did the recovery look like? And, you know, were there different plants coming back earlier? How has it sort of progressed over the past few years? Yeah, well, I think, you know, initially it was it was um, just insane to see the impact of the fire. So I was, um, yeah, actually in a, in a helicopter um, flying across the, the fire scar looking for small unburnt patches that animals could have um, stayed in, uh, could have could have found refuge in, and flying across to the western end, it was just you know so stark that the fire you know had basically taken out you know all standing vegetation. There was nothing kind of green left at all, apart from a few small patches. Um, so initially, it was just there was there was nothing. There was a few you know there wasn't even you know fallen timber left on the ground. There was a few you know black sticks in some areas, and um, yeah, it was it was pretty amazing to see. But yeah, I guess within a few weeks, there were certain plants like the grass trees, anthuraeas that had a very quick flush of, um, you know, of vegetation coming back and they were, they were quickly flowering and trying to, you know, trying to recover. Um, and then, yeah, and then I think what we're seeing, you know, now, I guess what we're seeing is, you know, in certain patches, there's really hardcore recovery of, of some 
um, vegetation types, things like banksias and, and even she oaks, um, which are really important for the, for the endemic glossy black cockatoo. Um, we're seeing some areas where it's just a thick carpet and you can't even see, you know, any soil or any any stones or any anything on the ground. So, yeah, and then conversely, there are also areas, like I said before, where there's, you know, been, you know, really high intensity and some of those old trees have, have, have completely died and haven't come back at all. Um, so, yeah, but yeah, generally it's, yeah, I think, you know, four years on, it's, it's, it's looking pretty good. Um, I think one of the concerns um, by a lot of people over here is now that whole western end um, of the island is pretty much one fire class, uh, age class. So, yeah, so it is, um, you know, in, in the future, potentially, um, you know, we'll be looking at, at pretty extreme fire events again with climate change. And, yeah, we could see similar things happening again. Mm, yeah. I think it's it's one of the sources of hope is you know watching that recovery process and plants growing back and realizing there is resilience you know even after such a big event as a, a big hot bushfire like that um you know it's it's a, an inspiration i think to see how that recovery takes place it gives me a bit of hope i would just say yeah there, there was also a huge amount of um effort put in obviously across this fire scale you know with a whole lot of different agencies working so we were able to really um be well supported to document that recovery, not only from vegetation, but from faunal assemblages as well. But the native animals didn't have it that easy because there are some feral predators on Kangaroo Island that made their job hard. And I know that in a lot of the projects you've worked on, you've had one enemy and that's been feral cats. It's been Pat versus the cat in a lot of cases. Um, Describe to us the issue of feral cats on Kangaroo Island, and I can hear the audience, even though they're muted, booing and hissing. Yeah, well, um, as as I said before, we, um, you know, we are lucky on Kangaroo Island that we don't have foxes. Um, we do have cats, obviously, um, and we have a really high density of feral cats across the island, um, found pretty much in in every habitat. Um, I would say most, you know, most areas of Kangaroo Island are, you know, part of a cat or multiple cats um, home ranges. So there's been, Kangaroo Island has a, has a really big history of cat management. Um, it is one of the islands where um, we're trying to actually eradicate cats from. It um, would be amazing if we can do that in time. Um, so there is a huge amount of uh, work and research that has been done for multiple decades on the island. Um, by lots of yeah amazing people, um, but yeah, so it's 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 still a huge problem, um, and there's an active eradication program happening on the eastern end of the island on the Dudley Peninsula, run by the Kangaroo Island Landscapes Board, which is ongoing. Um, but yeah, the work that we've been doing um, on the western end of the island, which is is where um, I guess our, our main species of of interest, the Kangaroo Island done art, is found. Um, over the last yeah, we've been working on them for like yeah, good. Yeah, nearly 10 years um, out there. Um, yeah, we've got lots of cats um, having, a, having a really big impact on all of those really key threatened species that we've got out there on the western end. Um, and yeah, what we found after the fires was even though that fire was really huge and took out, you know, a huge amount of, of, of habitat and obviously a huge amount of lives of, you know, of, of individual species out there. Um, we did find that, yeah, a lot of the work we were doing initially was finding those little habitat patches that were left, because that's where we thought we would find some of these threatened species still still surviving, and we did find them. Um, but, yeah, we found very quickly that the feral cats um, out within that fire scar had also survived, um, and we're doing quite well, um, and we're moving across that fire scar, finding these little habitat patches and basically, you know, just, you know, yeah, having a, having a field day with all the species that were left within so at one site where we were working, which is now known as the, the Western River Refuge, which is the site that we've got the, the um, feral cat exclusion fence around, um, that was the first site where we actually found um, surviving KI Dunnarts. Um, but yeah, we I think within within about two or three weeks of the work that we were doing there, we'd actually taken out 11 feral cats and fairly large feral cats really quickly um, using cage traps and also Felix the grooming traps. Um, so we saw that, yeah, the cats were having this massive impact and, and coming in and predating upon whatever surviving animals we had left from the fire. So it wasn't only the impacts of this huge fire um, that, you know, that were threatening the animals, it was, uh, and the threatened species in particular, it was the secondary impact of cats. Um, and so what we were really concerned about was having these two impacts um, into play together at a really, you know, pivotal time. Um, that could have led to, you know, local extinctions, so local population extinctions, or even at that point, like the, the fire was so big, we 
you know, didn't even know what, you know, if, if we had potentially lost, you know, some species around and, yeah, we weren't particularly concerned about the KI Dunna um, initially. Yeah. Yeah, that's one of the species that has been a real focus for our activities on Kangaroo Island. Can you tell us a bit about that species and, and why it's of such interest? Yeah, so the, the Kangaroo Island Dunna is uh, an endemic subspecies found only on Kangaroo Island, and it is only found on the, the western half of the island. So, um, yeah, it's a, it's a pretty special little animal. Um, and so previously um, to the bushfires, there was really little known about this about this species in particular. And there'd been a lot of work um, over a long time trying to do research into it. Um, and yeah, previous to the fires, it was only known um, at that time from 13 different locations. And that fire pretty much came through and wiped out all but one of those sites. So at that point, it was, it was you know, we, we were extremely concerned um, that this species may not have may not have persisted and may not have done very well. Um, so we yeah, sprung into action pretty much to try to, you know, locate these guys because we certainly didn't want them to you know, disappear on, on our watch. Um, and so, yeah, so there was a, a huge amount of effort was put in um, to survey for this species um, through AWC, Cal Land for Wildlife, Cal Landscapes Board and Department of Environment and Wildlife. Um, and yeah, and so initially um, we had found them at this, at the one location um, and that's where we, you know, spring, spring into really, really rapid action with Australian Wildlife Conservancy um, to, yeah, to protect that, that patch of bush where we found them um, and yeah and within six weeks of the fire we had that that area protected from feral cats which is the the critical refuge which is yeah still got really healthy populations of donuts in it um today that's fantastic and yeah just that that rapid response of getting people onto the ground within six weeks to clear the area of feral cats construct a feral predator free safe haven and then you know maintenance ongoing since then but how important do you think that very quick initial response was and and how much was AWC able to help given our expertise? Yeah, I think, um, you know, really important at the time um, because at that point we really had no idea of the, of, of the, the species, you know, um, presence, I guess, after the fire. Um, we've since found that, you know, that it, that it has kind of recolonized a lot of the areas that it formerly was in and in some areas where it was severely burnt that the, the actual animals did seem to survive quite amazingly. Um, but that was after a huge amount of feral cat control across that fire scar area. But yeah, I think, you know, looking back to the time when we first found the Dunarts within this uh, little unburnt patch of vegetation, we were, you know, number one, we were, you know, absolutely elated that the species had, had made it through. But um, it also then meant this huge responsibility to protect those surviving animals because it was, you know, at that point it was like this, these could be the only ones we... Um, obviously hoped and thought that that wouldn't be the case. Um, but yeah, there was a, a, a huge amount of, I guess, discussion about, you know, what do we do? Do we you know, actually try to catch these animals up and put them into captivity or do we just kind of let them go? Or do we, um, you know, try to get rid of the cats or do we build a fence? Um, I think, yeah, there was, there was a lot of really rapid discussions around what we could do there. Um, and then it was yeah, very quickly kind of decided that, that fencing off that population was going to be the best option. Um, we already had a, a pretty um, thorough uh, plan to create the Western River Refuge before the fire um, and had approached AWC, who were, were certainly very keen. So this was a couple of months before the Black Summer bushfires. Um, and then, yeah, and I think, you know, amazingly, we had uh, the landholders on board. So the Dobe family, so Andy, Lip and Jamie, really important to this whole um, story. Um, so they had that land there that they were, you know, they, that was conservation land that they wanted for protection of threatened species. And they were, you know, yeah, just, just so keen to, you know, to have this project take place um, on their property, not only in the short term, but for the, you know, this is obviously a really long term project. Um, and for those guys to be really committed to it was was amazing. And yeah, and I think, you know, for, for us at the time, um, a small NGO, KI Land for Wildlife, just kind of this, yeah, one or two of us out there in the field working, putting out camera traps and putting out cage traps. Um, yeah, it was, there was only so much we could do. So um, yeah, I think, you know, to, for AWC to then be able to, you know, basically call us and say, hey, look, whatever you need, we're here to help you. Um, was pretty amazing. So yeah, so as as you said, we had um, yeah Murray Schofield, feral animal control officer, here within within weeks of the fire, um, helping us you know put out cameras to find cats and um, target cats with cage traps, and then obviously yeah getting getting Mike McFall and and his team down here to construct the fence was was incredible. 
Um, we also had a team of ecologists um, from from all across Australia that were able to come here and help us, you know, initially in a very, you know, really intense, chaotic time. Yeah. Um, but yeah, being able to get out there and and yeah, just yeah, get as much action on the ground as we could. So yeah, it was it was incredibly important. And I think you know what has been great um, is that yeah, this isn't just a short term project; it's a long term project. Um, so to have that long term commitment from AWC on the island um, at, at this site and hopefully beyond um, is is really important. I think to you know, to kind of have that long term commitment um, because yeah, bushfire recovery and you know threatened species recovery isn't a, a quick fix. Obviously, it's a really you know long term project. Mm. Yeah, I think one of the the sort of positive legacies to come out of that devastating summer was that enhanced kind of spirit of collaboration between different conservation groups operating all over Australia. Um, and I think that's continued. I think there is a lot more collaboration over the last few years than there was beforehand, sort of brought together by that crisis. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, central to that here on the island is the landholders. And so 50% of the, the bushland that's left is is privately owned. Um, so yeah, so a lot of the work that Cal Land for Wildlife have been doing over years is working with those landholders to you know develop um, conservation strategies for their lands um, and the species within, um, and that that works uh, ongoing. And then also yeah, to have that collaboration with the you know the the government agencies, so the Kangaroo and Landscapes Board, and also the Department of Environment and Wildlife. Um, there were also, you know, a whole lot of other, you know, smaller groups also getting out doing the work. So in some ways, you know, like it was a, it was a really full on time, and there was a lot of, you know, people you know, running everywhere and white Toyotas driving around with cat traps everywhere. And um, but you know, but what we've seen is is incredible, um, and the the work that has happened throughout throughout that. I mean, we've seen uh, from a cat perspective alone, we've seen um, approximately two and a half thousand feral cats culled across um, Western Kangaroo Island during that, you know, that post fire work up and up until now, which wow. is a, you know, it's a staggering amount of cats. It's, it's, it's huge. Um, but that's been people on the ground, setting cage traps, setting Felixes, setting soft jaw leg holds, um, you know, every day. Um, so it's, yeah, it's a, a massive amount of effort from a, from a huge amount of people, um, and yeah, really, really, you know, talented people as well. And yeah, I think it's been, been great to see. Mm. Now I'd love to talk a bit more about some of the other species. So we've mentioned the Kangaroo Island Dunart, which is making use of that feral predator free, uh, refuge, the critical refuge. And I wanted to mention too, you know, these Dunarts are small enough that they can actually travel in and out. So that's sort of acting as a core bit of unburnt habitat. And then as other bits of vegetation have come back, they're able to, to move out into the wider landscape. But there are other species too. And I know a lot of people are interested in the bird life and the, the unique species and subspecies on Kangaroo Island. One of those is the glossy black cockatoo. Can you tell us how they're going since the fires? Yeah, well, um, yeah, the, the Glossy Black Cockatoo program is is a, an amazing program. It's um, been a recovery team that's been working ongoing for for over twenty years now, I think, um, and is yeah, and has got some um, really great staff working out of the Kara Landscapes Board. Um, so yeah, so I guess when you've got a species like the the Kara Glossy Black, which is you know really reliant on one species of food, so it's, it feeds exclusively on the drooping she oak. Um, and yeah, and a lot of that area, um, the western western end of the island was really important to this species. Um, and yeah, once again, that fire was was huge, was was massive of huge intensity. And when you've got species like a kangaroo island dunnart, for example, um, they, we know that they can burrow or they they utilise burrows, so they could go underground. Um, whereas we've got a very a really large kind of uh, glossy black cockatoo that aren't you know uh, you know they're, they're quite susceptible to a to a large fire. So. I think you know it was obvious then that a fire of that scale, especially if it came through an area at night, those those birds, you know, there would have been you know direct mortality from the fire. So um, after the fire, there was a reduction um, in the population. But the good news is is that 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 population is actually doing reasonably well now post fire. So there's a, a population estimate of around 451 birds. And um, yeah, the um, glossy black coordinator Kalia Beres um, is is saying that the, the species is currently stable, um, but yeah, it's they are heavily reliant because they are heavily reliant on that drooping she oak. Any you know potential future large scale wildfires that could take out some of the stuff, some of the habitat that is currently unburnt. 
um, could have a, a massive impact on that on that species. So you know, I think they're they're definitely you know probably not out of the woods, but um, probably like the Kara Dana doing doing better than I think we probably would have originally anticipated um, directly after the fire. Great to hear. There's other birds like the Western Whitbird, which we know are making use of the the refuge at Western River. Um, we really haven't got time to go through all of them, but I did want to share the Kangaroo Island flavour of echidna, um, and they're quite different, aren't they? Yeah. So yeah. So I guess yeah, we we do have quite a few um, different yeah endemic species, and so yeah, this guy here, the the cow echidna. Um, yeah, is unique to the island, um, and yeah, we we have actually seen them. You know, they, they also are a species which has done reasonably okay after the fire, um, and yeah, obviously, you know, potentially could have could have burrowed down um, into into certain areas as that fire was was fastly moving across. But yeah, but yeah, so they are actually one of the the top twenty species um, in the the current um, threatened species. Um, Top top twenty list of, of animals right. for intervention and yeah and so we're seeing them you know doing certainly very well within the refuge and and with it uh, and surrounding it as well. They're magnificent looking echidnas. Now I've yeah. got a photo here, Pat, of you with a very small animal in your hands. This is not one that's endemic to Kangaroo Island as far as I know, but um, can you tell us what this small mammal is? Yeah, that little guy is a Western pygmy possum. Um, so yeah, so Kawa has got two species of, of pygmy possum. So the Western pygmy possum, which is the one that's more common, uh, and the little pygmy possum, which is is a lot less common. Um, but yeah, we've been we've been working um, with this species uh, originally after the fire. We found them within the the unburnt patch of, of critical habitat, um, and we were only finding them within that unburnt patch um, in the fire scar. Um, but we have seen a really positive response to this species as well um, within the refuge, and we're now seeing it spread out across the the entirety of the area, which is, has been really good to see. So they're finding uh, habitat and finding food, and obviously um, that species is is one of the one of the species one of the top species that we found in the uh, stomach contents of feral cats that we were studying post fire. Um, so cow donuts were there was ten percent of the cats at the refuge had had these uh, had had. K.I. Donuts, um, and then also we were finding large amounts of, of, of Western pygmy possums. And, you know, yeah, as you can see, they're pretty small, um, really vulnerable to, you know, to cat predation. Um, the pygmy possum actually spends quite a bit of time on the ground, moving between um, vegetation. And so on the ground, they're, yeah, they're, they're very easy prey for feral cats. But, yeah, pretty pretty cool little, little animal, that's for sure. Fantastic. Um... Just one more mammal, at least, and this is one that's turned up on camera traps, uh, both inside the refuge and I, I think beyond as well. Um, the southern brown bandicoot. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So another species, um, Kangaroo Island, is is really important for the uh, southern brown bandicoot because we don't have foxes. Um, so foxes are a, are a massive threatening process for this species on the mainland. So Kangaroo Island has always been known as a as a really good stronghold for the southern brown bandicoot. Um, also, post fire, we have found them uh, within, you know, feral cat, feral cat stomachs. We've got huge amounts of images of feral cats actually walking through the unburned patches with with um, bandicoots in their mouths. Unfortunately, um, so yeah, and we do have a, a small population of um, southern brown bandicoots within the Western River Refuge, and we're hoping that um, that in yeah in in coming months or, or you know next year potentially um, we might be looking at hopefully seeing if we can translocate some um, bandicoots from outside the fence into the fence to it's kind of have a have a really um, healthy population within there that are free from feral cat predation. Um, they're also really important um, ecosystem engineers, so really they've got a really important function of of soil turnover. Um, uh, yeah, within within its habitat so we would yeah hopefully we we can see them um make a bit of a bigger return to to that area that they formerly were in mm. it's pretty hopeful hearing about all of these species not only persisting so you know they've made it through this big catastrophe that was the the black summer fires on kangaroo island but actually doing pretty well and you know a lot of that is thanks to the interventions that were made by awc and yourself and the other collaborators on this project at western river refuge um, but, you know, just the resilience of these species, for me, that's really, really hopeful. Um, what's your vision, Pat? What would you like to see Kangaroo Island look like in 20 years, 50 years, 100 years, and, and the wildlife? How's that going, do you think? 
Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a yeah, really good question. Um, I think you know what I would like to see number one uh, above anything is is that this island can be really well managed for for fire um, for fire fire events. So working with all the different stakeholders, landholders, um, government agencies, and and, and develop a, a a really strong um, you know fire management plan and program, which is going to hold us be a lot more resilient um for future wildfire events which are you know unfortunately inevitable um so i think for me that's number one because without this vegetation and without the habitat um you know there's there's pretty much nothing um so i think that's my number one would be to see that that occur um i definitely see the western river refuge as like a bit of a, a bit of a hub um bit of a bit of a central location where we can have these these populations you know protected from cats um and also as as well as possible protected from from future fire scar uh, future fire events um i would really hope in 50 years that we've got um a lot more a, a better handle on really effective and new innovative ways to manage feral cats i think that's that's a huge one um and yeah manage cats across the island um and you know hopefully hopefully by then we we will have some you know really good techniques to to apply a, a full scale eradication of the island um, yeah, and I guess just, you know, I think it, it, hopefully we don't see any, uh, you know, species that we've got here that are really important to the island go extinct or, you know, even get more, you know, threatened than they currently are. I think, um, you know, what we've got on the island is, is really special, really important. Um, we've got great landholders, we've got great people on the ground, you know, doing work, really passionate people. So I think, yeah, I think, you know, if, if we can yeah, really manage that fire, I think that's that's the, the, the central key. Um, and, you know, we should be right, hopefully. Yeah, great. Well, look, it's been wonderful to talk to you, Pat. And I know it's been a really collaborative effort. Is there anyone in particular you'd like to thank uh, for this project? Yeah, for sure. Well, I mean, I think um, first and foremost, I'd like to thank AWC and the supporters that, that you know, kind of uh, were ready to spring into action at a time of, you know, severe crisis. Um, I think the Dobe family, um, the team that we've had working out at the refuge, past and present, a um, bit of a shout out to Jason Laverty and Vanessa Mesmer, our awesome um, uh, team that are working on the, on the ground doing all the ops work. Um, and all of the other organisations that we've worked with, obviously, Kangaroo Island Land for Wildlife and the landholders there. Um, also, Kangaroo Island Landscapes Board and Department of Environment and Wild and Water. It's been, um, yeah, a, a really you know big project, um, and yeah, we've been able to achieve a lot because of all of the hard work from all of those people and organisations. Well, on behalf of us listening, um, thanks to you, Pat, because I know a lot of those collaborat collaborators came together because of your efforts and putting people in touch. Um, so thank you. I think it's a, a wonderful project, and thanks for sharing it with us today. No worries. Thank you, Jay. Thanks. And for anyone Cheers. listening, if you've been inspired by this conversation and the work that AWC is doing with our partners on Kangaroo Island, please consider making a donation. You can do that at australianwildlife.org or you can get in touch by giving, giving us a call or sending an email. Um, and all those details are on our website, australianwildlife.org. Thanks again, and we'll see you next time.